Good morning, everyone. So today it's my great pleasure actually to share with you some of our recent work on really practicing, I call it practicing NLP in the healthcare. We're not physicians, but I, I feel like doing NLP, you need to really learn how we can uh, uh, integrate with the, the, the healthcare systems and it's like kind of practice. All right, uh, my disclosure, like uh, in, the NSA, in addition to my uh, professor appointment at the uh, University of Texas, I'm also started, I also started a company about two years ago and uh, trying to commercialize our software. So I'm actually having those disclosures. So for today's talk, I'm actually will uh, have four different components, a brief introduction to NLP. I think that can be brief. A lot of people here already have the background. And then I'll focus on some of our methodology work um, about how to really improve the NLP performance. Then I'll talk about the software which we built, trying to help like uh, uh, end users to really use NLP in their uh, applications. And I'll talk about a little bit more at the end about diverse applications we can do with those kind of tools. So what is NLP? In a broad definition, any system manipulate text is the NLP, including those texts on Wikipedia, website, social media, email, office documents, things like that. And within the scope of NLP, we also have different uh, specific tasks like information retrieval, trying to find the relevant articles, information extraction, which is giving a document you extracted the, the entities or relation of interest. And uh, right now in the clinical NLP domain, the main task is actually information extraction. That's what we do most of the time. Of course, there's also other things like a document classification, question answering. You see a lot of those cases as well. And uh, but today's talk, I'm actually sort of focusing on when I say NLP, almost equivalent to information extraction, trying to extract the entity and the relation from the text. So why we're interested in doing NLP in the healthcare? Because uh, healthcare is full of free text data, and in EHR, about 70% of data are unstructured and the detail in patient information are in those documents. And uh, if you think about biomedical research, the primary communication among scientists are papers, right? So there's a 27 million probably, like a primary uh, uh, articles right now. And we need some tool actually to help us keep updated with all those knowledge. And once you done NLP with those tools, you actually can support different applications, decision support, business intelligence, clinical research, surveillance, things like that. The, the most work I do is on the healthcare analytics as well as clinical research. So I'll talk a little bit about application we have done in those areas. And since uh, uh, I do mostly on the clinical NLP, I just show you an example of clinical notes. I guess a lot of people here probably are they seeing. Yeah, it talk about 70 year old woman with history of diabetes, maladies, hypertension, blah, blah. As you can see that text, it's very different from what you are reading from English news articles, right? Uh, four of abbreviations and grammatical sentences, uh, heterogeneous format, sometimes a table, then a list of items, then the free text piece. And then there's also sometimes they have very long sentence with complex structures. And the regular NLP methods we develop for open domain, we definitely want to leverage them, but sometimes we feel it's a challenge. We have to develop something new specific for this type of uh, text. That's a slide I borrowed from uh, Dina at the NLM and talk about what's going on in the last 20 years on the biomedical NLP domain. As you can see, the growth of published papers uh, grow quickly. And there's uh, all different NLP tasks has been touched in the, in the biomedical NLP domain. Moreover, there's actually a lot of NLP systems has been developed. Okay, so in my view, I classify those systems to two types. One is a general purpose NLP system, the other one I call specific purpose. General purpose NLP system, which extracts all type of clinical concept, disease, uh, drug, lab test, uh, they are modifies. So it's kind of general, you can extract all type of information. It usually takes a lot of time to develop it, requires a lot of resources. And so there's actually really just a handful of those general NLP system like Medley, Metamap, CTEX, uh, Knowledge Map, a, a couple more. But then there's a, a lot of specific purpose system, which is a, I do this research project. I need to extract these five elements, smoking status, bleeding events, uh, all those. So you build a specific pipeline to do that. You can call it an NLP system too, or call it an NLP pipeline, okay? 
there's a must be hundreds or even over thousand different NLP pipeline or system built for specific purpose. So given all those like uh, active research and productivities in the in the clinical NLP, you may think we are actually quite advanced in in uh, uh, to implement and using all those NLP uh, uh, technologies in the healthcare. But the reality, I think, we are still very slow actually really apply to NLP to all different applications. The challenge is really those general NLP system, they, they are helpful, but when you as a research trying to do a specific research project, you actually have to build on the top to further customize to the smoking stat to 95%, 90% accurate. Then those specific purpose NLP system, they usually report actually very high performance on, on their data, on their application in the paper, but you grab it, you run on your own local data, it dropped by 10% or even 20%. And you have to do a lot of work to customize it again. So the generalizability issue, I think it's a big thing. It's really prevents the wide adoption of all the existing NLP system we already developed, okay? When you move from one type of nodes to another type of nodes, one institution to another institution or one application to another, it just doesn't work directly. No off-the-shelf solution. You have to customize or, or do it again. And I'll give you an example uh, on the smoking status extraction. Uh, I guess a lot of people know the CTEC system. It's an open source clinical NLP tool. They develop a module for uh, smoking status detection. And it's a hybrid approach combined machine learning uh, approach to detect an entity mention versus rule-based approach to summarize the entity and the document and the patient level. Okay, it's a hybrid system. So. Original performance report in the male data is 85.5. I grab it, I run on Vanderbilt data, it's like a 79, uh, 75%, 10% of dropping the performance. So what we need to do, I want to, I cannot just use it like this, so I have to boost the performance. So I have to uh, collect the local data from Vanderbilt, then I actually re-annotate the data, retrain the model, and I work with local physician actually actually come up with slightly modified rules as well, okay? So the whole process for our team, we have a good connection with physician, we know all the NLP algorithms, we, we have the right access to the data. It may take us like a one to two weeks, let's say, okay, to get it done. But in a lot of other places, it may take months, okay, for a team, for someone want to do NLP to apply to clinical study. So it just, very time consuming and costly, try to optimize uh, NLP pipeline for their local application. I think that's the, the problem with the current uh, NLP research and uh, production. And uh, then the question is, uh, if you think about, we want to quickly build an NLP pipeline with high performance, what are the component actually really matters what are the things you want to think about to, 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 uh, before you can build like a 90, 95% performance NLP pipeline? The first thing you may think is, uh, okay, algorithms, okay? So from originally, most of Kango NLP systems started, I think before 2005-ish, it's all pretty much rule-based based on patterns. After 2005, because of several challenges, release big data set, the machine learning start picking up, show good performance in those challenges. Recently, deep learning technology is all over the place. Everyone is talking about the recent burn model. Everyone wants to use it, <laughs> okay? And, uh, but there's actually a lot of uh, issues when trying to do those machine learning or deep learning approaches. For example, I just, uh, uh, based on our experience, we also moved to deep learning now, but, just give you an example, the BIRM model, when I use the CIF model, when I predict one discharge summary, our system usually uses 1.2 second, okay, to predict. But now I switch to BERT, the, the prediction itself requires about 15 seconds for one node. Not even talking about when you train the big book model, you have to have a lot of resource. So it has also a lot of uh, implementation issues. Of course, deep learning also have the advantage, like less feature engineering, that's for sure, it's actually very attractive. So, but there's a, still a lot of balance. And I keep thinking, rule still going to play a good, good role. So I'll show you some examples. So I always say it needs to be hybrid system in the, in the uh, uh, medical NLP. And the second thing is, uh, it's really about data, okay? It could be 
and label data could be label data, but accessing clinical text data for large volume, it's, it's always an issue, okay? And then talking about building machine learning more, you have to annotate a lot of data, okay? I think we haven't spent a lot of effort on really looking at this annotation process, how people or physician or, or healthcare uh, 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 providers help you annotate data and the quality, data quality, the, the cost of those annotation versus the resource you have to build this system. It's a, actually a lot of issues here. I'm gonna talk about this too. So the third part is really about human or slash knowledge. So when I hear say human is a, human could involve this development just like a annotator, help you annotate data, or working as a domain expert adding rules to this. But there's also human curating knowledge bases, can go terminologies or some kind of knowledge bases that can also help you when you develop the corpus or develop an algorithm or even mapping to the standard concept, right? That plays a big role. And those three components, they are not like a separated. When we're building a high performance component, we actually have to interact them and then try to integrate all those pieces together. So in the past about like five years, my main research focus is really think about how you can integrate all those algorithm data with human in the loop to build high performance NLP system. And I'll talk about those individual pieces a little bit. And then I'll give you some examples of uh, how we address it. So algorithm, I will talk about machine learning based uh, approach. So I give an example. This is the, one of the, I think, widely used data set, which is a 2010 I2B2 challenge. Giving a this is a summary, you go ahead, detect the problem treatment test. Like here, Plavix is a drug, and the her recent GI bleeding is a problem. You need to detect that, both the type as well as the boundary has to be correct, okay? So this is an entity recognition task. And uh, to convert it to a machine learning task, what you do is you, using a BIO tag. So in the second example is showing the, um, trying to figure out if this works. Okay. So you have to lay, make a label, starting off the entity with a B. Inside the entity is I, or are the outside boundaries O. So then converting to the task, say, giving a sequence of sentence, you predict what label should you give to every word. So it can become a sequence labeling task. So that's a machine learning task, okay? And in the early days, like 2010-ish, when we participated in this challenge, we are now the second in the challenge. What we do most is uh, try different traditional machine algorithm, like uh, uh, CIF, SSVM, or try different feature, do a lot of feature engineering, bag of words, distance dictionary uh, or different representation from the unsupervised learning. And also we try different entity attacks. I'll show you like a, what are the effect of uh, the performance on at that time. But now those days, we are talking about deep learning, okay? We moved uh, from uh, those uh, traditional machine learning to deep learning. I skipped a lot of deep learning algorithm. I just come to the, uh, the most recent work we just published using BERT model for deep learning, which is a pre-trained uh, context embeddings, okay? Uh, those different language models. There's even people publish BioBERT. So in this study, what we're trying to say, utilize those uh, uh, most recent BERT uh, algorithms, pre-trained on clinical text, and to see, to evaluate on the uh, existing data benchmark. And I'll show you the performance change of the year. So this is almost like a, uh, last 10 years on this data set, what do we have done? Try different algorithms. Start from the beginning at the challenge, we tried the CIF, our uh, performance is 83-ish, ranked the second. And the best one, they add some brown clustering feature is 85. Then later, we also try SSVM, also reached to 85.9. But then we did some deep learning, just use the word embedding, this is the 82. But that's almost equivalent to this bag of words. So compared to the bag of words uh, baseline, it's still 5% increase, right? But then BioSTM coming, it reached to like a 89, uh, 85, 89. Almost this, just use word embedding is as good as you are doing all the feature engineering. Then when birds come in, it actually boosts the performance to 90. 
So if you look at this, you feel it is a big increase, right? From we tried everything 85, then you just run bird, get 90. But you have to think about, it took us like 10 years to get there, okay? To have this new algorithm, get 5% increase. But then I'll later we'll, we'll show you, if you really know the data, you focus on annotation, you can get a lot of performance gain as well, okay? You can run the state of algorithm, but annotation is also a big thing. And if you're interested in learning more deep learning on the uh, uh, Kingo NLP, we have a review paper just published and you can actually look into that. So now I talk about data. The first thing I want to really talk about is uh, the availability of data. Because of clinical text, everyone say, oh, because of privacy, security issue, we just cannot release the data. So there's a bunch of work actually trying to de-identify the text, removing PHI, like a name, address from the text. And that's why we did some work. So that's one thing. But today what I'm just trying to mention is another way of uh, 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 sort of de-identified data. Because uh, even you did this, you reach 95%, then people will say, what about the 5%, okay? And uh, uh, there's also say, even you de-identify those names, but the sequence of the clinical event happened to the patient, maybe also going to help you re-identify patient. So then we actually have a recent uh, project with uh, other uh, sites like Mail is, uh, can we actually just generate synthetic notes? fake notes. And uh, I feel this interesting is that uh, we got some results. It's very preliminary, but I want to show you. Uh, the task is we want to generate HPI section, uh, history and present illness. We look at I2B notes, which is about 800 notes. And uh, we try different uh, text generation method based on deep learning, SIGGAN, GPT-2, CTIL, different methods. And uh, for text generation, you usually brew to evaluate. And if you look at this, uh, CK is actually very low because it, it's just small corpus. But those GPT-2 and the CTR using like a pre trained model, just fine tune on the Kinko text. So the performance actually pretty uh, reasonable over here, especially for GP 2 But that's a, that probably doesn't tell you much about those numbers. But I'll just give you an example. What are the texts come out from this GP 2 uh, algorithm? If you read it, I think it actually reads quite well. This is a 39-year-old female with history of diabetes mellitus, coronary artery disease, who present with short of breath and a cough. Has no relief from uh, uh, anti-acids or anti-inflammatory. But this next sentence is something I, I, I really uh, feel funny about. She's admitted now with the increasing radiation damage <laughs> to her house. That might be the reason for the next reason and extensive medical bills, <laughs> I guess. Uh, you get depressed with <laughs> medical bill, then you get admitted, okay. But you, you, you have to say it actually reads okay, right? Uh, although semantically or the coherence, it doesn't, but, but it's actually quite, so my next step is that I'm gonna use these fake notes. I'm gonna annotate the entities in these notes. I'll train a model. Then I see applied to real notes, is that actually help? If it helps, we can release this kind of uh, fake notes, at least a lot of people don't have access, they can try all different algorithms, right? So that's, uh, that's kind of my point. So my second point that I try to make for this annotation of data is that uh, annotation quality actually matters a lot. A lot of people didn't aware of this. I just give you one example. This is not my work. I brought this work from Kirk. That's the 2014 I2B2 challenge, which is trying to extract in 36 risk factors. A document, they, like a diabetes patient, is the H, H, uh, H1AC value high or low? They want, so it's a, they made it as a document classification task. And the provider, uh, the, the organizer provide the training data, test data, then they also highlight the evidence mentioned, say H1C is 7.5, okay? But then a lot of team tried all this fancy algorithm, but this team, the winning team, what they did, a traditional SVM, algorithm. They just noticed the annotation provided by our organizer is noisy and messy. The boundary is not consistent. When they annotate the mention, they didn't annotate if this is a negative mention or, 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 or a positive mention. So they add those more fine grain annotation to this data set. Return model using SVM. And guess what? They get almost like 3% of increase. That made them from seventh 
in the, in the challenge to the number one among out of 20. So all I want to say is uh, annotation, right annotation for the task and the good quality is actually really matters for your, for your machine learning based NLP. And then the third point I want to make is, uh, uh, is about annotation costs. We all know annotating uh, clinical corpus is time consuming and it requires medical expertise. You ask your physician sitting here annotating for, for days it's even you pay a lot of money, I guess not many people want to do it, okay? So reducing annotation cost, but still keep you good model is the key. I think it's a challenge for all other machine learning based uh, approaches. So here I'm actually talking about one study we did uh, about what called active learning. There's actually different methods to deal with this, like transfer learning, domain adaptation, but we did this active learning study trying to annotation cost. And I'll show you a little bit about what we've done. So in a typical way, when you build a machine learning model, you have this unlabeled data. Then you have someone, you randomly select, say, 500 nodes. Someone, physician or intern, mostly residents probably, <laughs> annotate these 500 nodes. Then you train your model. That's kind of random sample selection. But in active learning, we start in the iterative process. You, you randomly select five nodes. Someone annotate it, then it train a model. Use this model, you go predict for the annotated document. Then you say, I pick five sample, which is the most uncertain based on the current model. Then you, the, the, the annotate, annotate. Then you have five plus plus five, you have 10 day, uh, sample. You rebuild the model again. Then you go predict the unlabeled data, get another five. So by this, doing this, what you is, uh, we call it active learning because it's uh, uh, actively picking those uncertain samples. And uh, the comparison is random sampling. It's also called passive learning. So the goal is uh, maybe I actively picking those uncertain sample. I only need to pick 250 sample. I train a model. It's almost equivalent to the performance you're picking 500 because you are picking running, but now I'm picking with a, a purpose, with a model. And so that's the whole idea. So among this, the, the, the most critical part is about algorithm we call querying. Say, how do you pick that five? Okay. Uh, a default way is uh, we call uncertainty based, like I said, just the, if this sample is most uncertain based on the model, we pick it. But then we develop algorithm also consider the diversity. So we try to balance between uh, uncertain and the diversity with the new algorithm called cost. And to evaluate it, what we usually do, we do a, what we call a learning curve. So you have a separate data set for measure the performance. Then when you increase the sample size, you measure the model's performance against this independent data set, so you can draw a learning curve, okay? And what we did is to achieve a performance of 0.8 F measure. Uh, we did the simulation study. The simulation study, we already have the data annotated, but assume it's not annotated. When you pick that five, we assign the label. That's the, the, what we call simulation, okay? Then to reach 8, uh, 0.8 F measure, what happens is the, the uncertainty based sample only needs like a 2,000 versus the random sample is 8,700. It's almost like 66% reduced. Uh, if you look at the line here, that's 80%. Then you look at the, the on the EXO, like uh, what are the uh, numbers of documents, it's a 66% reduction. We are really excited. We published this paper in this simulation study. So then uh, I think one good thing about uh, medical informatics is we really, we're not just doing simulation. We really move this to a real application. So if a computer scientist, uh, sometimes they stop there. Then for us, we try to really apply it to the real tasks. So I start building a system with the interface to ask people to annotate with these algorithms. And uh, we also optimize the workflow because we noticed if you just, uh, uh, when the, the training sample gets 200, retrain the sample maybe will take one or two minutes. You cannot just let the, the annotate sitting there waiting for one minute, right? So you have to separate the workflow of training model versus annotation, okay? And then we did two user study, did both passive learning and active learning. But the results is not what we expected. One showed improve, one showed doesn't improve, even getting worse, okay? That's really puzzled us. So we looked back into the literature 
and we logged into the data. So then we noticed when you do the simulation study, you made a, one assumption. The assumption is when you have this sample, you assign the label. You just assume everyone annotate this sample within the same time, right? It's not actually people label it. It's just give the label because the label is already pre previous labeled. So every sample, they assume that's the same time people spending. So that's the whole point. So instead of you picking this sample, you consider it uncertainty, but then you have to adjust for actually annotating this sample may cost you more time. That's called a cost. That's where you come up with this uh, cost aware active learning, which is that you not just think about the utility, which is the uncertainty. Well, I don't know if I could over here, but then you also have to measure the normalized by the cost. When you pick up this sample, this sample may, how much time it may, may, may cost you to annotate it. But then we don't know how much time, right? So we have to come up a model trying to estimate when people, this is a longer sentence with a lot of entities, uh, complex structure may take longer time. So we develop a model using all those synthetic semantic features to build a logistic model to predict how much time that that sample may take. So that's why using this cost aware active learning, we did another study, which was uh, nine users. And uh, by running this way, eight of nine users actually showed better performance on active learning versus running sampling. And the saving is not 60% anymore. It's about 20 to 30%, but still it's good, right? But then by doing this, actually, there's a lot of interesting findings. I just raised one example showing how complex, how complicated the annotation process. So at the top, if you look at those, this is the learning curve. If you like those two lines, we are monitoring the quality of the patient, or the, of the annotate, when they annotate the data. They annotate 10 minutes, another 10 minutes, another 10 minutes, okay, along the time. What's their annotation quality? The red one is the random sampling over here. The blue one is active learning. What do you see? When time goes by, annotators who go with active learning, their performance is dropping. But random sampling is also dropping because it's natural because you're tired, fatigue effect, effect, right? But they're dropping slowly. That means we, we talk to, I think it's really about when you active learning, you keep picking difficult cases. People get tired quickly versus uh, random sampling. Sometimes you pick easy one, sometimes you pick difficult one, they are more stable. So how those like a fatigue effect and how that affects the, 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 the annotation, it's actually very interesting how you bring all those into the model, right? That could be our next step. Now I'll talk about uh, human, how human play things in this. What I'm trying to say is, uh, like I said, it's complicated to annotate. We actually don't know how people annotate the text. What it really matters, what affected the time? So if I ask you a question, do you think people annotate faster, is, uh, have high quality, or people annotate slower, have high quality? It's actually difficult to say. This is exactly this diagram actually I'm trying to say. Over here, this is the annotation speed. Higher means annotate fast. This is their annotation quality. I cannot see like an easy pattern that like annotate fast is better or annotate slow is better actually. But what I can see is the extreme slow one, not good, okay? Means something, they, 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 they are not annotating good. But extreme fast one probably also not good. Maybe they're careless, okay? So it's, it's a lot of things interesting. And then I also, over the other table, I was trying to say, uh, there's a different syntax structure of the sentence. How the people reading those complex sentence, but then we also find, uh, so the uh, features are a number of words, the syntax structure, complexity, but different users seems like their response is different to the different complexity. So it's just worth looking into this a lot more. And uh, then I want to make a point about rules. I keep saying rules are important. This slide is what I'm trying to say. So we tried, uh, this is a task about extract medication and adverse event in the Kinko text. Okay, it's a N2C2 challenge in 2018. 
we were ranked in a number one in this challenge. What we look at it is uh, we try to convert, uh, try to hard on different algorithms like SVM, CNM, BioSTM. It increased the performance 97 to uh, 98 over here, for example. Okay, and over here that maybe 73 to 75. Okay, that's good. But then we actually add the post-processing rules. We analyze the error, but you see how much rules actually uh, improve, especially on those uh, machine learning performed uh, uh, worst ones, like a reason of the drug. 73 jump to 83 by adding rules. And our rules are actually really simple. I say if a, if a modify about reason, never actually a machine never classify to an entity uh, a drug, just remove it. It's actually boosts a lot. That's why I say the rules keep being effective, especially there's a, a lot of situation machine learning cannot perform well, and then you still need rules. So last one is about trying to. I think knowledge plays a good, uh, very important uh, aspect in this case is. Uh, when you extract the entity, you still need to map to standard terminology before you can apply to a, a clinical decision support. So the mapping this entity to the standard terminology is also a difficult task. We call it encoding, and I have different issues to talk about here, which uh, I, I don't think I have much time to talk about, so I, I just want to let you know uh, those knowledge sources actually play a big role here. And uh, I'll just skip this one because I, I notice I'm running a little bit late. And uh, uh, this is our, just give you a sense about the state of art on encoding. It can reach to almost 90 on the specific data set, try different algorithm, including the bird algorithm we tried. We have done work on the encoding snowman codes, encoding major codes, uh, mesh, uh, 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 things like that. So that's it. Now I, I sort of talked about all the, different methodology pieces we have done trying to improve the performance and you can probably see the complexity of boosting the NLP performance. But then back to my generalizable, uh, generalizability question, for end users, how can we actually transfer those technologies to really help them quickly optimize their NLP solutions? And that's why we, we, we felt we, we need a software platform actually to support them to do all those activities. And the, the whole idea for us to develop this system called CAMP, Kingo Language Annotation, Modeling and Processing. At one point, it's similar to MetaMap, like a general purpose NLP system. But the whole idea when we build this system is trying to make it a platform where you can develop your own pipelines to customize it. So we built a lot of uh, components, like a part of CG tagging, tokenizer, entity recognition module. Then when you build your own pipeline, you can drag drop and uh, actually build your own pipeline. And each of those components is customizable. If it's a dictionary-based approach, you can replace your own dictionary. If a machine learning-based module, you can re-annotate data and uh, build your own machine learning module. And uh, uh, the other purpose is uh, this is about development pipeline, but then when you have the pipeline, you try to deploy it, we also want to make it efficient. So once you optimize everything, we actually allow you to uh, export as an independent job file. Then you can build web service, you can interact with Epic, interact with other health information system easily. So our goal is really shorten the time of development and the deployment of NLP system. And I'll show you some screenshot about, this is our annotation interface. So you can define any ent entity you want to extract, then highlight it, annotate it, then uh, click a button, it will just build a machine learning module uh, using different features. And then you, we will be able to compare what's machine predict with uh, what's the goal as standard annotation, right? Then physician or domain expert can quickly find errors. And if they find an error in this case, Tamulusin is uh, labeled as a lab test. It's in the drug section. Sometimes it is lab testing the drug in your blood. So it become lab test. So it's ambiguous. So they can highlight, they can uh, adding rules. They, if it's a medication section, make sure it is drug. Okay, and behind is a rule engine. And for algorithm wise, we're actually putting everything into a, 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 a package we call DeepMed now, because we participate in almost a, like a 10, 11 challenges over the last 10 years. We're always ranked number one, number two in the different challenge using different algorithms. So we're putting all those algorithms start from the uh, old CIF, SFM to LSTM, 
to birth into one package, and that will be a separate Docker you can train using GPU or things, because a lot of the, the interface is running on the CPU. And uh, since our release in 2017, I think uh, it has been downloaded quite a lot, about 1,800. And uh, at this time, we have about 50, 60 downloads per month. I think it's doing okay for like a very specific purpose, King on LP system. And uh, we're also developing something we call the enterprise version now. Because uh, like I said, I think uh, annotation is really important, but no one's actually helping end users say, how do you should make your guideline? How do you check your quality and make sure they're consistent? If it's not consistent, what, you, what can you do, right? And how, how do you train the model easily with all the machine learning modules? So we actually standardize the entire like uh, annotation process. We say, oh, this is a step. You build your team, you uh, connect your data source, then make your guideline, do annotation, we check quality, train model. You follow this like step by step. Here we say, when you have some data already annotated for, by our client, by Brad, by something, we actually help you converting the, the existing annotation. And here is to say, you, how do you gen, uh, uh, build a guideline? You have to three rounds, okay? Every round, everyone is testing it. Then what's their progress? And if they have comments, we have a way to actually for you to, to, to put it into a submit to everyone to discuss. And then this is the annotation interface, uh, have a lot of uh, 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 more features like a, a pre-annotate a lot using a dictionary, things like that. Then the second part of the enterprise version is also about analytics. So the previous desktop I built is like for individual people working on LP. But the enterprise, if you think about it, it's really building for the team. You have a team working on NLP development, but then you also have a team trying to support all the end user. And the end user, this team will schedule, hey, use this pipeline for this, pi uh, for this data source, run every Tuesday at 2 a.m. using these three machines, okay? And then after run it, then you have end user want to say, I want to extract these five elements. I want to define it. I want to extract it. I want to download as Excel file for my study. So that's the purpose for this analytics. So this is our interface for different tasks. This is our interface for uh, um, scheduling, like which pipeline run what time. This is our, uh, you define a variable, smoking status with this set of keywords, this set of uh, concept, then we will merge it as become one variable. You define five variable, you can just extract it from text. We will highlight the, the evidence of those variables. Then you can download the whole thing as Excel sheets. So uh, basically, I think, uh, th like I said, the goal of this whole system is trying to support individual or team to shorten their development or deploy time, and even for the end uses of the, of the, the, the system. And I'll try to say, once you have this kind of system, I just described later what you can do as an application, okay? Uh, one study we did is for hospital quality measurement. That's for Memorial Hermann. They are reporting VTE cases every day. So they, the typical workflow is they do, they have two people, manual review radiology reports, find the VTE term and encoding with a snow echo. And we did this whole thing like HL7 message daily dump of the radiology report to the server, run NLP, build an interface, let them review. We predict the snow codes. And they say, high recall, no cases can be missed. So we're trying to optimize the reach sensitivity 89, PPV about 90%, that means one of the 10 is actually missed, but they can correct, oh, no, one of them is wrong, but they can correct through this interface. So it reduced from two FTEs to 0.4 FTEs for this task. And I also do a lot of uh, study for clinical studies. Um, one of the area I'm doing is uh, for drug repurposing study of uh, using EHR. So instead of you finding something bad about drug, we're well, trying to find something about good of the drug that might be can treat another disease. So this is one study initially we did trying to say metformin, which is a drug to treat diabetes, can it actually impact cancer survival? So you, we found all the uh, uh, tumor patient with diabetes, are they taking metformin or other type two oral type two diabetes drugs? Then we compare those groups. And what we did is we did initially did at Vanderbilt, then we run the whole thing at the Mayo Clinic. The blue one is actually the, the diabetes survival, uh, the, the metformin survival. The red one is other oral type two diabetes drug survival. Then you do see 
the improve on the survival on the type two type, uh, on the metformin drug. And we can quickly replicate this whole thing at uh, Mayo Clinic because all those uh, information extraction, like a uh, covariance about smoking status, uh, height, weight, and all those things, we, we use the NLP. Then we just run actually our NLP pipeline to Mayo Clinic, extract all the variable, conduct the same study. And this is stratified analysis on individual cancers, also showing some benefit of this drug at both sites. And later, a uh, recent publication, what we did is uh, the previous ones, we already have a hypothesis. Metformin may improve cancer survival. So we, we develop a case control study. But he, over here, what we do is uh, we don't have a hypothesis. I locked through 153 all the chronic disease drugs and affect their survival on cancer. And what we find is actually nine drug cross both Vanderbilt and the Mayo has a has a has a, a good signal, and a couple of them actually already under clinical trial investigation. And we, but I want to make a point: is that evaluate this signal is very difficult. Okay, and we use clinical trial, we use literature. Then the next table it's complicated. I don't want you to read it. What I want to deliver <laughs> the message is: that when you look at the literature about this. A drug and this cancer, you got signals all over the place. Some people say it, it, it improves survival, reduces the cancer risk. Some people say it causes cancer. Okay, literally every signal is to have something like. So we have to make a ratio between positive versus negative. Okay, so that's why I think it's it's difficult to validate all those signals, and we also apply the NLP to this kind of. Uh, uh, biomedical data discovery. We have a project, BD2K project, which is trying to uh, find a biomedical data set. So we go to different repository, find the discretion about data set, raw NLP indexing, build search engine. So that's another use of NLP on the ingestion and the searching. And this is the interface. We're indexing currently about 2.3 million data sets, and you can search through this interface. Other use cases uh, about passing clinical trial document uh, for eligible criteria, maybe finding patients, matching patients between the, uh, the trial and the, the, the local patients. And we also apply to social media. We, we did some um, stress uh, information extraction associated with uh, uh, suicides. I think I'm reaching to the end. <laughs> Okay, so just a, 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 a summary. I think, uh, I hope uh, this talk really convinced you there's a great uses of NLP over the place in the healthcare. And uh, I, I keep thinking uh, interacting algorithm, data, and human actually is the key to improve NLP performance and we will continue on this uh, direction. And uh, I think the practical tools that actually will allow users to efficiently customize building NLP pipeline will play a good role, a big role in the wide adoption of uh, NLP uh, in healthcare. And uh, I'll thank to all the collaborators, all the contributors, as well as the uh, fundings from the NIH and other institutions. I'll thank you, everyone. I'm sorry if I talk too, ta uh, too fast. I thought I won't be able to finish, <laughs> but uh, I did it, uh, yeah. So any questions from Hua? Go ahead. So I saw that you were using GAN in your, uh, in your preliminary work, and I was wondering, does that mean that you're having the system generate this static notes and then you're having a separate machine learning algorithm trying to detect whether that's a fake note or not and submitting that information back to the initial algorithm to like, help it learn? Uh, I think we have two notes, we have fake notes, then we just compare those two, trying to have a, you can need a generator, need a discriminator, trying to do this. But I actually, I have to admit, it's my postdoc did this work. I haven't really looked at the, the, the algorithm he has used for the sick can, but basically it's a sequence to sequence kind of uh, 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 tran uh, translation algorithm trying to generate the text, yeah. I can send you more information about this, but we haven't published this yet. But the, the, the SIGGAN approach is, uh, we only use that 800 clinical uh, uh, text, which is, uh, um, uh, didn't use any other like uh, pre-trained language models from like open domains. So the other two approach like GPT-2 versus uh, uh, CTIL, which is actually built on the uh, pre-trained language model from open domain but we actually fine-tuned on the Kinko text. 
That's why the performance looks much better because it learned a lot of like engrams language patterns from those open domain. But the game uh, methods only translating between 800 uh, Kinkle nodes. That's why the performance is not that good. Unless if we have a lot of like a Kinkle corpus to train, that maybe boost the performance a little bit more. Yeah. So re really nice work. Uh, Thanks. Impressive. Um, wh one thing uh, I wanted to ask is about uh, using uh, NLP as a way to benchmark data quality on structured data. Uh, can you comment on uh, those uses? Okay. I actually, personally, I haven't done anything. I think what you mean is uh, you have the structured data like ICD codes, but then you have notes. How can you actually from the notes information, are they actually code them correctly, right? That about the quality issue. So I actually personally haven't done any comparison between like uh, the information in the notes and uh, compared to the structured data. But uh, uh, what I try to do as one use case is also talk to a lot of people is uh, basically similar to the computer assisted coding. So the issue with the uh, hospital is uh, uh, sometimes physician almost know that patient have, for example, even just uh, overweight, okay? But they never document in the text or in the in the code, so they don't have a code. But they but then running the NLP, they pick up those, then they actually say you may want to code this, uh, so they can make extra coding, then earn more money for the hospital. That's what the 3M and uh, uh, Optin actually provide this kind of uh, products. It's kind of one side maybe actually address your comments. It's also improve the quality right of the structured data because they are missing some codes. But the other part is also for like increasing the revenue. But on the quality side, I think there's a missing problem, but they also maybe there's a like a wrongly coded codes, right? That kind of application doesn't address that. So I, I, I haven't looked at it much about literature, like how exactly NLP uh, uh, text uh, uh, data versus struct data, how they align. I, I, I remember there's a bunch of people did that, right? Yeah. Just a technical question. This is a wonderful talk. So uh, you, you were showing the kaplan mayer curve for the drug, uh, those kind of drug repurposing study. How do you get the mortality information? Because that's oh, something that's very We, at Vanbel, we linked our tumor registry with the uh, uh, death in there. Oh, actually, the tumor registry itself has the death information. The tumor registry, because we, what we did is uh, I found all the tumor patients in the tumor registry. Mm -hmm. Then I linked it to their EHR data. But those patients in the tumor registry it record all the death information. So that's yeah. a state, that's a CR registry? Or... It's not. It's like every tumor registry database, they record the death information. They, that's why they need a team. They enter all the information. They will call your relatives to find out if you deceased or not. In general, in the tumor registers, they have very detailed yeah. information about the tumors and, the, and yeah. the patients, but they all, most of the time, enter manually in, uh, at least yeah. in all the, the places that I've worked before, the tumor registers were basically entered manually. Somebody goes to the record and enters all of that information. Right. Because that is right now a big challenge. Uh, that has been a big challenge for our uh, PHI study. So we have to pull mortality yeah. for multiple yeah. resources. For tumor patient, that's a special case because a lot of tumor registry capture very detailed uh, cancer information as well as survival information. But for other diseases, maybe not the case. Then uh, uh, when we were at Vanderbilt, we also linked the EHR data with the Social Security Death Index. There's a database you can purchase, actually you can link them. I think they changed the policy a little bit. Uh, I don't know if you still can link it, but. Uh, previously, actually, we did link the social social security death index database with your local EHR to find out the death information. Yeah, because death is really important outcome. So the tumor registry death data is not well um, is not well populated here in Indiana. We've oh. done linkages with the death master file. Okay, um, but because of the changes in policy, the linkage is less accurate. Oh. We are, Coon, just FYI, within the next six to nine months, the state has agreed to uh, once again give us their state death registry, so that information will be returning yeah. at some yeah. point. So we will have that information again at with fairly decent detail. 
Yeah, that's good. Every state also maintain a death registry, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Oh, yeah. That's that's really great. Yeah, go ahead. I have a question. Given your your experience in NLP, how have you seen it change um, in uh, as, as notes become more templated and more um, free text, but free text generated based off of structured data elsewhere, just yeah. with macros and such. How does that affect the work that, that you're doing? I, I think the trend is always being a uh, uh, structured narrative, what we call. So section-wise, the template is a lot of structures, but within a section, they will fields allow you to enter textual data, right? Uh, I think uh, back to like nine, 10 years ago, uh, Trent Rosenberg uh, actually wrote a paper. I'm also a course on uh, debating like a completely structured EHR versus like a, a free text, freedom for writing the free text. I keep thinking free text still will exist because the physician needs their, a way to express their opinion. Once everything is structured, you feel like a, you're almost certain about what happened to that patient. But in free text, you can express a lot of uh, uncertainty or their thoughts about this patient. And that might be also avoid some legal uh, issues, right? Liability issues. And uh, so I, I, I think uh, um, the trend probably is this kind of structured narrative. You're trying to, you're getting more structure in terms of the template on the sections, but within each section, they will textual fields allow you to enter notes and uh, enter the details of the uh, 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 patients. I think answer your question, I think I understood your question a little different than Hua did. Uh, I think you were talking about templates like Epic that have this sentence that just plugged in into the text, right? And you can actually modify them in the middle. Oh, you, you, like a uh, yes, text like a, template. Yeah, text is that template. what you were asking? Um, I, I was referring generally to okay. uh, more the, the note bloat that we have from bringing in all these other structured pieces, for example, bringing in a social history that is formatted a certain way. And, um, yeah, because bring sort of like a template to the note, mm -hmm. right? And bring sort of like some already preformed sentence to a note, right? Mm -hmm. That you can modify or not modify. Yeah. It's tricky. <laughs> Is that another question over there? Uh, my question is about scale. Um, fascinating work, awesome presentation. Thank you for sharing Thanks. that with us. Um, we are fortunate to sit on a, a very large repository, which includes hundreds of millions of notes. And so I wanted to ask, just in terms of sort of comparing, um, trying to gauge where we're at based on where you, what you've done, because you're quite um, accomplished. What kind of scale have you done a lot of these this work on the scale of note sizes, you know, what's the end of notes that you've been doing your work on just so we could kind of compare yeah. and how would we measure up based it with your excellent credibility? Yeah, good question. Cause now we're talking about big data. We actually have tons of notes, but so far for our work, what we tried is uh, our UT physician notes. I, I run about like a three years notes, maybe uh, a few million notes. That's the, the biggest batch I have run so far. Uh, we try to, for example, the enterprise version, because when you click process, it also really depends on what kind of resource you have to run it and how long will it take. And uh, so we tried a little bit on uh, the scale of searching, searching millions of text data, no problem. But I haven't tried way more than that. And the other thing is uh, also about running those NLP systems in a uh, 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 more kind of parallel computing infrastructure, for example, Hadoop, Spark. And uh, we, as a camp system, actually, we also uh, uh, sort of re-engineered a little bit. We'll be able to run Spark system to, to parallelize the thing. But it's probably not really optimized. And we actually recently looked into, there's a native, like a Spark NLP framework called a, a Spark NLP. Uh, over there, they actually build the whole thing based on the Spark architect. And we're actually thinking about retraining every different models to that framework and build a pipeline uh, on the Spark NLP framework that's probably going to run faster or more natively on the on Spark platform. Yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, for batch processing, Amazon had, I, have you heard of the Amazon Medical Comprehend? So they must have a structure. Their business model is uh, 
you send me your data, I'll process for you. So it's all on the cloud. And they must have like a kind of uh, uh, infrastructure to handle. But, but I would say it all depends how much money you want to spend, right? You, you, you want to <laughs> pay a lot to Amazon, on, allocate a lot of servers to, to Riot, or you, uh, time maybe it's not an issue for you. You're just getting one server, it may be around one month. Yeah, so I, I think these days, the processing speed or the timing, uh, it's re related to the NLP system itself for sure. Your NLP system should be robust. You, uh, you want, if you do multi-thread, you want break leaking the memory in the middle or it support the Spark environment. But the other a big issue is also about hardware you have, what kind of uh, hardware resource you have to, to process the text, yeah. Well, thank you so much for this thank awesome you. presentation, Juan. Thank you. Uh, while we also presenting for those who don't know, tomorrow at the uh, well, School of Informatics and, and Computing on the, the building, uh, the IT building on the other side at noon, right? I don't know right? the time, actually. It's at noon. <laughs> I didn't we, see the schedule. We, have the, uh, we, we did send around the invitation for that as well. So if you want to do, he's going to have a a slightly you different talk. But you don't have to come again. That's about the same <laughs> talk, okay? But uh, just so you know, it's a similar talk, okay? Just so you know. And thank you all for coming. Thank, thank you.